back. So I was asked a while ago what fat burning foods there are and also how to burn fat. I found it a bit perplexing as I didn't think people still thought this was a big thing. Um, it's something I can remember specifically searching for on the internet when I was younger, preparing for bodybuilding shows, you know, trying to get in my best shape sort of thing. I always wanted the edge and thought I might be getting a panacea of benefits just by including fat burning foods into my diet. Little did I know I was wasting valuable time that I could have just been investing into things which do actually make a difference. Um, conventional wisdom would say that we should eat less and exercise more. As many of you might know, this isn't exactly as clear cut as it sounds. Um, I'm going to address why. So let's deconstruct the misconceptions once and for all. First, I'll state the obvious, which some of you might have already picked up on, is that fats don't get burnt. There is no fire happening within our body. They get oxidized. So all fat we consume is stored as adipose tissue, believe it or not, body fat. It is, however, released in response to the output we force upon it. From this, we can understand that we need to be able to access that body fat so we can oxidize it appropriately as per our requirements. So how do we do that? We do it by ensuring our body is in a fat adapted state. What I mean by this is that if you consume an excess of carbohydrates, of which all are actually just sugar, believe it or not, we negate the likelihood that our stored body fat will be utilized. Having carbohydrates in the diet, especially in high amounts, will clog up, clog up and it creates what I call the carb hole. So you think of your body as if it were a cup. So you keep putting more, more sugar into it. You know, it's piling up, it's piling up. Eventually it will spill over. The same is true in our body and when we feel our glycogen level. This is a limited storage system in our body. Something like maybe five, 600 grams of glycogen we can store and, you know, a little bit more in the liver, things of that nature. It will just eventually spill over and increase our body fat levels. That's just how it works. So whilst our bodies are in a state where it doesn't need to oxidize body fat, so, you know, consuming excess carbohydrates, when we're doing this, we're elevating insulin. What this does is force our insulin to raise and our glucagon levels to lower. This has a downstream negative effect on our ability to oxidize body fat. And just to clarify, insulin is a storage hormone and glucagon is a catabolic hormone. They work in conjunction with each other to move the body systems into a state that it can function best. Clever adaptation we got there, isn't it? <laughs> so another important part of this is the factor of the Randall cycle or fatty acid cycle. This was identified in 1963. The researcher, Sir Philip Randall, obviously, um, found in short that when we have an excess of glucose and fatty acids within our bloodstream, we activate this biochemical cycle. I'll show that here in the video. For anyone that has an understanding of biochemistry, it might be useful to see. You'll also see is the amount of ATP in each part of the equation is producing on it in either side. So it will say 10 to 40% of glucose metabolism for one, then 60 to 90% for fatty acid metabolism on the other. This, without question, destroys the myth that we need a lot of glucose for energy. We need some which can be provided and at adequate amounts through gluconeogenesis. This is basically the process that transforms the non-carbohydrate substrates into glucose. These include lactate, amino acids, and glycerol. What it does is quite interesting, actually. Um, it's, it's basically a double-edged sword, in my opinion. So it acts as a protective mechanism for the body to minimize hemodynamic and ischemic stress to the heart. How it works is that it reroutes the excess gluc glucose into muscle glycogen. Notice I mentioned in, in just previously, it only minimizes damage. It, it still can occur when consuming carbohydrates, especially in excess. Um, 
However, the problem here with the Randall cycle is that it prevents the breakdown of adipose tissue into fatty acid acids to be used as an energy substrate. So ideally, we don't want to cause the body to activate a process just for the sake of activating a protective mechanism. It doesn't make sense to me. Also, we want to be able to use stored body fat we have so we can regulate our body composition more favorably. So how do we do this? We consume less carbohydrates in all forms. That includes starches, you know, simple sugars, everything across the board. This forces our body to oxidize the stored body fat efficiently to meet the requirements of our body. So, you know, what are we expending each day? That's what's going to provide the energy. I've heard whispers about studies that have shown equal or similar results when comparing a low carb to a high fat diet. This is inconclusive. Um, ultimately, they may both work by minimizing the activation opportunities of the Randall cycle. But if we know one of those, the one containing more carbohydrates causes glycation and damage to the body. That's a topic for another video, but as you can see here, as we go further and further down the rabbit hole of burning fat, it's not as plain cut as what the studies might suggest it is. So how do you tackle the issue of excess body fat? Knowing what I just explained at least. So I'll outline three key points. You have to alter your macronutrient ratios to affect your energy balance. This may require some tweaking and it's something I actually specialize in. So feel free to contact me if you need any help with regards to that. That's just a shameless plug, obviously. Um, the next is increasing muscle mass. So that also increases your metabolic rate. This can be from doing resistance training, something simple as just standing up. Some of my viewers might have disabilities or health issues that prevent them from exercising. So it may be more difficult, but there can be a number of ways to work around it. And finally, perhaps the least useful out of the three with good reason is increasing our energy expenditure. So, the problem with that is when we've looked at studies and seen how much we're expending, you know, as we exercise, what we find is that there's actually this very little proportion in relation to the amount we are oxidizing, then, you know, the sugars, the fatty acids, whatever it is, to produce the energy. So it's, it's not going to be a lot. It's not going to make a massive difference. Um, so we know that our bodies requirement for oxygen increases as we elevate our heart rate. That's cellular re respiration. Um, when we are breathing heavier than, than a rest, this will cause us to oxidize more energy, which transversely happens to reduce our body fat. If there's any more detail on this that you need, let me know in the comments and I'll try and dig a bit deeper into the subject. So I hope this information has been valuable and I hope, also, also actually hope to hear you know, what methods have you used to lose body fat? What did you find most effective? Comment below. Any, anyway, I'll be back with a, another video soon. Cheers.